This photo by Australian photographer Paul Jones is a wonderful reminder of our capacity to be delighted with the most minimal things in life. Um, I want you to start by thinking for yourself, what is it that you want to grow in your life? Is it the size of your bank account? Is it the pride you take in your accomplishments? Is it your artistic ability? Is it the strength of your relationships with your friends and family? There's no right answer to this question, folks. You can um, decide that the bank account's what you want to grow after all, or the number of friends that you have on Facebook. It's cool by me. I'm not going to judge. I just want you to ask the question. What is it that you want to grow in your own life? Our exploration of economic growth starts in an unlikely location. Uh, this is the car park of a Walmart in the United States, and that's me proudly standing in front of a Winnebago. Um, this is the start of a cross-country journey that I took with my partner and our little baby boy visiting family and friends uh, last year. And um, we had with us uh, along on this journey one of these um, delightful little GPS devices, you know, the kind that say, turn left in 100 yards. Um, and so we're cruising across country in our Winnebago and everything's going fine until we hit Chicago. And in Chicago, our GPS tried to kill us. Here's what she did. She said, turn left in 100 yards. And we did. And then she said, drive straight. Only this is what we were looking at. <laughs> And if I had done what she told us to do, drive straight, we would have crashed right into a low bridge. Now, what, what went on here? Um, there wasn't any wrong information in the GPS. It's just that the GPS was missing some really critical information, <laughs> namely the fact that we were in a Winnebago, which is a very tall vehicle, and there was a very low bridge here. Um, this whole dimension of height was absolutely missing from the GPS. The GPS is just a representation of a very complex reality. Now, our economy has a GPS as well. It's called the GDP, Gross Domestic Product, and this is what we talk about when we talk about economic growth. It's not just the GDP. There are other things that are part of our economic GPS as well. Um, the things that guide us along and tell us whether our economy is in good shape or whether it's in bad shape, whether we're doing well as a society or actually on the wrong track altogether. The economic indicators that we hear about all the time What's the Australian Stock Exchange done today? What are our unemployment levels? What about consumer price index and inflation? And how's our economic growth doing? These are all part of our GPS, but they're not the real thing. They're not the actual economy. They're just a representation of the very complex thing that is our economy. And just like the GPS that tried to drive us into the side of a bridge, our economic GPS is missing some very important dimensions as well. And I want to try and talk about what some of those dimensions are. Um, here's what we usually think about as the economy, uh, the GDP, and I'm just going to use Australia as the example here. Australia's GDP is $1,223 billion a year, and this represents um, the value of all of the things that are produced in the marketplace. Um, the basic rule here is if money changes hands, it's part of the GDP. If no money changes hands, it's not part of the GDP. Think of all the production that goes on where no money changes hands. I want you to think about this. Have you ever taken care of a sick relative? Have you ever taken care of a child? Have you ever cooked dinner at home? Have you ever cleaned the leaves off your roof, taken care of your garden? Have you ever volunteered for a community organization or for your school? If you have done any of those things, congratulations, you are a part of the productive, unpaid workforce. All of those things that we do are valuable. If we tallied it all up, how much would all of that be worth? Fortunately for us, a fellow named Duncan Ironmonger up at the University of Melbourne has spent a career trying to answer exactly that question. He's done very detailed studies of the amount of time that we spend on all of these things and what it would cost if we weren't doing them. And uh, for all of these um, unpaid activities, you come up with a figure of about $1,270 billion a year. That's more than all of the stuff that we produce in the marketplace. What about all of the things that nature produces for us for absolutely nothing, for free? We took a very direct interest in this um, last year when the Australian Conservation Foundation, the organization that employs me, um, uh, uh, sought to restore 
a threatened wetland area to health. And um, the, the wetland that we were concerned with is a place called the Hatta Lakes. This is a map of the Murray-Darling Basin here. And the Hatta Lakes is right down here by the town of Mildura. It's on the Murray River, and it is an internationally significant wetland. But it hadn't had a drink in quite some time. Of course, the Murray-Darling's been under tremendous stress as a result of drought, but also as a result of the fact that we've cleared a lot of the native habitat there, and we've taken a lot of water out of the natural systems. So we went to our supporters and said, can you help us put some water back into this wetlands? And with the assistance of our supporters and with the credit union, MECU, we bought four 400 million liters of water and put it back into the wetland. Here's what it looks like when you turn the spigot and the water starts going right back into that wetland. We asked ourselves when we did this, okay, this is a great thing for the environment, but what does it mean for the productive value, for the um, economic contribution in the region? And the more that we looked into that, the, the more that we were surprised by just how large some of the figures start to add up to. The wetland acts like a big sponge, right? It soaks up water when it rains and it releases it gradually into the system uh, over time. Uh, it also purifies the water as it comes through the system, and it provides habitat. That habitat's good for the environment, but it's also really good for the farming communities in the area, because some of the things that um, uh, uses for habitat include bees, which pollinate the crops, and uh, a number of bird species, which act as pest control. If we did not have these wetlands, the price, uh, the cost for those farmers would be higher because they would have to spend more on pesticides, they would have to spend more on pollination, and uh, that all has positive economic value. This also isn't just a sanctuary for wildlife, this is a sanctuary for humans. 70,000 people visit the, uh, the national park around the Hatta Lakes every single year. Um, and that has value as well. It has a direct value in terms of the contribution to tourism, but it's also good for the souls of the people who live in that community. When you add all of that up, this little wetland area alone has a value to the Victorian economy of $14.5 million a year, or roughly the economic contribution of a small factory. But it's invisible to the way in which we measure the economy. We ignore it. It's not part of our economic GPS. $14.5 million just for the Hatta Lakes. What about Australia's environment as a whole? Well, some economists um, uh, in the United States, um, led by a fellow named Costanza a little while ago, tried to estimate the value of the uh, um, economic contribution of ecological systems right around the world. And we've taken some of the methodology that they used and tried to answer that for Australia. And the number that you come up with, very conservative estimates here, is around $1,164 billion a year. Now, we haven't included some things in there. We didn't include, for instance, all of the value that we get from the sun. The sun dries our clothes. The sun makes our salt. The sun warms our buildings. The sun grows our crops. We haven't included the value of any of that in here. So if you actually put in, um, there's a lot more that you could put in here, and you would very quickly get to much larger numbers. But just as a starting point, uh, a trillion dollars um, at least a year that our environment's providing for us, um, that's left off of our economic GPS. What else? Damage. Our economic GPS is completely blind to the damage that we inflict on ourselves and on our economy and on our environment through um, uh, many of the most challenging issues that are facing us today. And I'll just give a couple of examples here. Greenhouse pollution, $18 billion a year left off the economic GPS. Obesity, $60 billion a year left off the economic GPS. Resource depletion, all of the minerals and the energy that we dig up out of the ground and use and don't have the advantage of in the future. World Bank estimates $77 billion a year cost to the Australian economy. All of those figures are losses, they're material losses, we could be doing better. Um, but they're not counted when we decide what's economic growth and what isn't. So here's a picture of the real economy. It includes all of the productive value of um, our community production, of our ecological production, and of our market production. I'm not saying it's not important, it's great. Um, it puts money into our bank accounts and puts food on our table, um, so it's important as well. Um, but it's not the only thing. Now, why does all of this matter? Why does it matter that we define the economy only as the blue bits there, only as the market? 
Um, well, if we're only making decisions based on what makes the blue bits bigger, then we're going to make some bad decisions because some of the decisions that we make might increase our market production, but might do so much damage to our community or to our environmental production sh systems that we're left worse off at the end of the day. We hear a lot, for instance, about the need for greater workforce participation. What's going on when we move people from community forms of production into the marketplace? Well, they're certainly making more in the marketplace, but it's not like they were just sitting around on their hands or watching television before. It's, th it's those people who were looking after the elderly, taking care of our children, cleaning our homes, volunteering in community groups. And we need to um, take into account all of those things that we don't have the more people that we put into um, what we think of as um, marketplace production. Now, all of these figures we didn't just pull out of a hat. Here's the full story. Um, there's a lot of detail behind here. I'm not going to run through all of it. Um, feel free to pop onto our website and you can see all of the different components of each of these areas of valuable production. And we've pulled together the most credible sources that we found out there and um, just done a breakdown across all of these different categories. So there's a lot of rich detail that's in here. Now some of you are going to be thinking, um, uh, wait a minute, that those billion dollars that you found uh, for community production, it's way too low. And others of you are going to be thinking, those billions of dollars that you found for community, way too high. And my response to both of you is the same. If you don't like our graph, go to your own darn graph. <laughs> um, what can we do about this? What do we need to do to fix our economic GPS? Three suggestions. First of all, we need to invest much more into collecting the data about the value of our economic production and the value of our non-market production systems. Currently, the Australian Bureau of Statistics spends less than 2% of its resources on energy, water, and environmental statistics. That's not good enough. Um, second of all, we really do need to fix our national accounts. Um, our national accounts include all of the core economic data that our governments use to make decisions. They're incredibly important. When we look at um, how often we've measured the energy and water components of our national accounts, um, we get data about every four or five years on that. Can you imagine if we only gathered trade data every five years? Or if we only thought to check in on unemployment every five years? No. Um, but for energy and water, we only get those about every four or five years. On biodiversity, we have never produced a biodiversity account that's part of our national accounting framework. And despite the fact that we know that our fisheries are in, uh, some of them are in a terrible state, they're being overfished, we have never produced a fisheries account. And the last time that we checked in and tried to see uh, of all of that um, unpaid work that we do, what's the value of it, was 1997. On the other hand, price of bananas in every capital city in Australia, I can give you quarterly data on that um, going right back to the 1980s. <laughs> What's the value of the, of the environment? Don't know. What's the price of bananas in Hobart in September? I can give you that. Um, so we need to fix our national accounts. It's the very foundation of policy decisions. Um, finally, the third thing we need to do. Um, data collection is one thing. Building that into our national accounts is another. We need to make sure governments pay attention to that. Um, governments make policy choices and business make investment choices. And we need to make sure that this information that we have and the way that we present it is not just there, but that it actually has an impact on our government. So the next time you hear a politician talking about the need for economic growth, ask yourself this. Are they only talking about marketplace growth or are they also talking about growth in our ecological production systems and growth in our community production systems and trying to tackle the costs that, uh, um, that we know can be dealt with much better? These are the things that we must demand of our governments. We must require of them that they do better than just economic growth. A couple of images to um, leave you with. Here are two people. One of them is preparing dinner, the other is working in an office. Which one of them is part of the productive workforce? Our national accounts say only one of them is. I think it's both. A wetlands area and a power distribution line. Which one of these is part of our productive infrastructure? Our national accounts say only one of them is. 
but I think they both are. A worker on a construction site and a worker taking care of a child. Which one of these pictures is contributing to economic growth? Our national accounts say only one of them is. I think the answer is both. Now, I started by asking you what it is you wanted to grow in your own life. And I'm going to finish up by asking you what it is that you want us to grow as a society and as a community. Do you just want us to grow the market economy? Or do you think we should also be growing the ecological economy, the community economy, the whole economy, the real economy, our economy? Thank you. Thank you.